if you could choose any year to be born, any year at all, between today and, say, um, the birth of Jesus, what year would you choose? If you wanted to have a good, rich, happy, materially well-endowed life, is there any period of time you would prefer to have been born in than the year you were born? No? You're quite happy being born when you were born? I, I, I think that's very wise because as we looked at with this graph, if you were born in pretty much any period in history, that's, that's the year Jesus was born, that's where we are today. If you were born pretty much anywhere in the world before this moment, you almost certainly would have been dirt poor. You would have been um, poorer than the poorest poor person living in the poorest county in the poorest village in the Delta. You would have been really, really poor. In fact, people were so poor in the past that the poorest household in the Delta would probably have been more prosperous than the richest person in Europe in the 1400s or the richest person in Asia in the 800s. So we, we looked at this in some detail and we looked at, at, at why it was we get this explosion of wealth that happened so recently. And um, we, we talked about this idea that for a society to be rich, people have to make more stuff per person. So that, you know, we talked a, a little bit about how the, the total population of the world might have increased or sometimes decreased, but the amount, that people, amount of stuff people could make for every person that lived um, meant that people never grew richer. There was always a limit to, to wealth. And this changes, and it changes round about 1776, um, when a couple of quite interesting things happen. Not just the American Revolution, Adam Smith, we talked about, wrote The Wealth of Nations, so people began to understand um, how wealth was created. And also the Industrial Revolution, in 1776 is the year that there was a patent on a steam engine in, in England, the beginning of this, this change. What I, what I want to do today is talk about three quite complicated ideas in economics that get to the root of why this process of takeoff was possible. Why was it that people were able to make more stuff? Why is it today that people are able to make more stuff? And they're three quite, quite complicated ideas. Last, year, last month we were talking about this idea that if you make everything yourself as a person or as a country, you're poor. If you become dependent on other people, you become wealthy. And I, I want to kind of slightly elaborate on, on what, what it needs for that to happen. And the first, if we can have the next slide. The first key idea in economics I want to try and explain is, is this idea of what is a price? What, what purpose is a price? How does, how does a price work? Um, and I've got on this um, chart some examples of people trying to control a price. So if I start off, what, what is a price? When you buy something and it's, there's a price for it, what, what is that? Who sets it? How, how do you determine a price? The amount of work. Mm. That's interesting. I, I understand why you say that. From the point of view of a company, you might say the price is the amount of effort and work. Actually, that's wrong. I could spend all day laboring away producing the most vile chicken sandwich and offer it to you. And I say, hang on, it cost me 50 bucks worth of time to make this. I'm going to sell it to you for 50 bucks. The fact that it cost me 50 bucks worth to make it doesn't make it, doesn't price it at 50. What, what, what is the price? It's the amount of work that you You're a genius. You're a genius. Um, <laughs> that's exactly what a price is. It's what someone is willing to sell something for and what someone is willing to buy something for. And, and that's all a price ever is. 
It's not about a politician's idea of fairness. It's not about how much effort I put into it. It's certainly not about how much I as a consumer want for it. If it was about what I as a consumer want for it, iPhones would cost $50. And um, big trucks would cost the same as my beat up old Jeep outside. A price isn't about what the seller wants or what the buyer wants, it's what they're both willing to do together. And, and this is a really critical point when talking about public policy because most politicians think that a price is something that they somehow can decide as fair. And I'm going to give you the first example here. Now, don't, don't quote me on this because I, I, I love our Attorney General and she's a wonderful woman. Lynn Fitch is a fabulous woman. She's going to be speaking to you later and I won't hear a word against her. But during COVID, remember how during COVID the government made us all wear those masks? And I don't know about you, I hated wearing those masks, but I lived in London at the time and the, the, the politician said by law I had to have a mask. And so we went from a world where no one needed masks to where everyone had to have a mask. And guess what happened? The, the, the price of the masks went up. It went up enormously. Here in Mississippi, there was a famous case of the Attorney General criticizing people for selling masks at too high a price. Now, what is a price? A price reflects how much people want something and how much of that thing there is around. So, you know, you've got a COVID crisis, of course the cost of those horrible masks is going to go up. Well, what politicians, and I, I shouldn't single out anyone in Mississippi, but what politicians around the Western world tried to do was to say that that was unfair, the price of those masks should be lower. But why, why, do you think, why do you think if you have a COVID epidemic and suddenly you need lots of masks, why do you think actually a high price of those masks isn't a bad thing? Why, why, why might it be a good thing to have suddenly something become very expensive? As the price goes up, so does the supply of the Absolutely. Absolutely. When politicians said you can't spend more than X number of dollars selling a mask, all they were doing was making sure that masks would continue to be less freely available. By, by having the price of something go up, the price does one really important thing. It sends a signal. It sends a message. Any factory out there that's currently making, I don't know, mops or broomsticks or, or, or whatever, if you switch to making masks, you can make a lot of money. So having the price set freely without political interference ensures that you get more of something if more people want it. It's a really clever system. In, in a socialist system, you would have a politician saying, well, there are three million people in Mississippi, you're gonna have X number of masks every day, and they would allocate the number of masks we need based on their calculation. And that never ever works. It's been tried again and again and again. Every socialist system, they try to plan it by top-down control. We don't need to do that. The pricing mechanism does that beautifully. The pricing mechanism does that without any interference from, from political control. By having the price of masks go up, within a few weeks of that, the price of masks started to come down because more and more people produced them. Now, here's another example I want to give. This is a very long line of people, and they're standing outside a really quite grubby little apartment in Dublin, and they're all desperate to rent it. And at the time this photo was taken, I think, in the whole of Dublin, which is a city of several million people in the Republic of Ireland, there were only a few hundred apartments in the whole city available for rent. People were so desperate to do it that they stood in line. And and the reason for this is because the government controlled the price of rent. The government said you're not allowed to charge people more than a certain amount. So what happened? Landlords stopped renting out their apartments. Instead of using the price to control the limited supply, people stood in line. I mean, I, I, you know, if you're standing at the back of the line, wouldn't it make sense if you could pay the landlord, if you could say to the landlord, look, I'll, I'll pay a little bit extra every month in order to get to the front of this line. 
but price controls mean you can't do that. It, do, it doesn't mean you get more apartments. It doesn't mean you get more places to rent. It actually denies people the opportunity to get what they want and they're willing to pay for. Um, it's not just America and Europe that where this happens. This happens around the world. This is an example of um, India. So politicians in India discovered that the prices of onions were high. And so they, they, they decided that in order to help ensure that people in India could get onions, they would limit the price of onions. And guess what happened? Farmers stopped growing onions. So we went from having a small number of expensive onions, so if you really, really wanted an onion, you could buy one, to not having any onions in that province of India at all. Um, I, I know that at some point at university and, and when you've left university, you will come across people who will present this idea of controlling prices as being a new idea. And, and often you will be told it's, it's progressive, it's, it's a modern. Actually, it's one of the oldest ideas, the oldest and the stupidest ideas that we've had. This is, this is uh, the edict of uh, Diocletian, uh, a Roman emperor. He, he, um, he was the kind of Joe Biden of the um, Roman Empire, 300 AD. You had inflation. You had um, too much money printed or, or too much money created. Prices were going up and up and up. So he produced a system of price controls. This is uh, 300 AD. Um, it, it didn't work. It was a disaster. It was like, it was, it was a sort of giant version of all these price controls. And um, you know, it's not a coincidence that within 100 years of, of this social, socialist system in the Roman economy, the Roman system collapsed completely and, 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 and faded from history. So the idea of price controls is very old. It's very dangerous. It's very bad. Prices are good. Freely formed prices may seem annoying if you want something cheaper than it's available. It may not seem fair if you think you can produce a really good thing that no one wants to buy. But actually, it's the fairest system of everything because all of us decide in a free market what the price is. It's, it's very democratic. It's not Lynn Fitch deciding. It's not the emperor deciding. It's not the governor deciding. It's not the king deciding. Everyone decides. And the price, it, 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 it creates the incentive for people to produce more. It sends a signal. We, we looked last week at the guy making the sandwich. And um, he had to do all the different tasks. Even making a chicken sandwich is complicated. Um, making an iPhone, making a smartphone is even more complicated. Think about making a, a car, all the different bits that go into the car, the rubber, the glass, the, the oil, the paint. Coordinating all of that, that's another thing the pricing mechanism does. It creates this, it's like the nervous system in, in, in an economy. It creates this incredibly effective coordination system. So the first thing I wanted to really express today is that for that growth and prosperity to happen. You have to have free, freely set prices. Arnica is now going to introduce us to the next concept in, um, in um, don't, don't press click quite yet. Now I'm going to show you a short little video about a second idea I wanted to talk to you about. And by the way, does anyone have any questions or any thoughts? Am I going too quickly? No? Um, this, this second idea is called the division of labor. Now, when we, we met last month, we talked about how incredibly difficult it would be if you were to try and make a chicken sandwich from scratch. Um, and we, we, we saw this little video. Today, I want to show you a video that kind of almost shows the, the, the logical extension of that. Think about the last time you went to Chick-fil-A. When you went to Chick-fil-A, you ordered what you wanted. The person you ordered from probably didn't walk away from the window, go and get some bread out of the refrigerator, go and start frying up a bit of chicken, go and slice the lettuce. The person you ordered it from only did one thing, and that was to take your order, type it into a machine, and then deal with the next customer. In other words, getting you the chicken sandwich was done by a whole bunch of different people, each of them doing just one thing. I mean, literally, sometimes if you go to McDonald's, there's one guy whose one job is to put the lettuce in the, in the sandwich. There's another guy whose job is to fry the, 
uh, the burger. There's another guy, you know, if you, if you ever take time to look at what happens in a, in a uh, fast food restaurant like that, you get these incredibly specialized tasks that someone does and does them really well. And this is the division of labor. So I'm going to show you this little video now, and it explains much more articulately than I can this, this second really important principle of economics. The benefits of voluntary trade are obvious. Suppose this guy has bananas, and this guy has oranges. He needs oranges for marmalade, and this guy needs bananas for banana bread. They swap. They exchange. Each guy is made better off through trade. In our last video, though, we saw that a key fact about the modern world involves more than simple exchange, more than merely moving existing things around. We grew rich by also producing more stuff per person. Say you're cooking hamburgers and fries for your family. It might take an hour for you to prepare the meal because you individually do everything. You start the grill, you cook the burgers, chop the fries, slice the vegetables, on and on and on. But now look at how a burger joint makes hamburgers. Each worker has a specific job in the chain of production that serves burgers and fries to its customers. Each worker is specialized. This specialization, what Adam Smith called the division of labor, makes individual workers more productive. No more lost time switching between tasks. Plus, as a worker concentrates his effort, he gets better at doing the task at hand. But it's not just the specialization of workers that increases output. It's also the development of specialized tools that modern workers use. The burger joint has tools to slice potatoes, to cook burgers, and to fry the fries. That's just specialization 101. I'm sure you've seen one of these around. The container. They're everywhere. Cargo transported by ship used to be stored in barrels, in sacks, in wooden crates, and offloaded by hand. The invention of the container, though, created more than just a metal box to put stuff in. With it came a wave of specialized technology that dramatically increased the productivity of shipping and offloading. Ships themselves evolved, dwarfing their predecessors with the ability to stack containers below and on the deck. Ports changed too, dredging deep waters and providing specialized pilots and gantry cranes to quickly park and unload ships. Driverless yard tractors magically whisk containers away. The containers are put on trucks and trains built specifically to hold them. Workers today are superhuman compared to their brethren of yesteryear. We went from carrying bags on our backs to lifting the equivalent of two school buses with mere flicks of our wrists. To make specialization worthwhile, you need to make a lot of stuff. For example, there's no point specializing in hamburgers if you plan to cook only one burger a week, or buying a forklift or a crane simply to unload weekly groceries from the family car. Trade provides a market big enough to make it worthwhile to invest in specialization. And the bigger the market, the more we specialize, and hence, the more we can produce. Did anyone have any, any thoughts or comments or questions? No? You mentioned Adam Smith, um, and we talked about him last week. By the way, how many of you have heard of Adam Smith before, before this session? Musa, Kane, obviously. I hope, I hope Professor Beecham, you have. I'd be alarmed if you had. No, Mallory? I know the guy on the video. Do you? Okay, you know him personally? Yes. Okay, don't tell him I said the thing about the stereo heads. <laughs> but they are a bit stereo. <laughs> it wouldn't bother me. They certainly get your attention. <laughs> yes. Um, did, had you come across Adam Smith before? No. You hadn't? I don't think so. Okay, okay. Well, I, Stephen Scaltelli's got his work cut out. Because Adam Smith is almost the grandfather of free market capitalism. He lived in um, the 1700s in a small village in, in Scotland, St. Andrews, I think, where, where famous for golf, a university town. And um, it's easy to remember the date of his very famous publication, 1776, The Wealth of Nations. Um, you, he's someone that you, 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 sh you ought to be aware of. I'm not saying you need to go out and read his entire works, but he was the first person who really articulated this idea. Um, he popularized, if you, if, you, if you like, these ideas. Um, now, Adam Smith, you're, you're, incidentally, you'll come across some of his ideas in, in The Rational Optimist. Um, Adam Smith was the first person to really explain some of these ideas. There, there were others, um, um, 
but the division of labor he he looked at a pin factory in in the uk and he measured the output the number of pins that an individual could make and then he looked at what happened when in the making of the pin each person was allocated a specific task and he he scientifically measured the growth in 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 productivity when you, you know, when you divide labor what I, what I now want to talk about is, if, if this is true for people working in a community, if, if the division of labor explains how Chick-fil-A can produce so many sandwiches by getting everyone to do one task rather than having people running around trying to do everything, if that's true for a community, it's also true for countries. If countries can specialize, and some countries can do some things, and others can do them. And, and um, we're not going to play it quite yet, but the next video, it's a little longer, but it, it's, it's really the kind of third idea I wanted to introduce you to. And it's, it's called comparative advantage. And that might sound like a bit of a handful, and boy, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of talk about fish and bananas in this video. And there's a lot of math in this video, and, and a lot of it went above my head. But I hope you can follow the general outline of it, because I think it's a really fundamental point. If you have freely set prices and if you have the division of labor, you then have this thing called comparative advantage between countries. A, a quick question. How many of you have heard politicians use the slogan, made in America? Yeah. Is it, is it good if you buy something that's made in America? Why, why is it good? It's a, there's no right or wrong answer. You're buying stuff made by American workers. It's, I would put that a different way around. It's wonderful when American workers are able to buy, uh, to sell you something that you want to buy. But if, if I was to tell you that I wanted to start a made in Mississippi campaign, and you had to buy cell phones that were made only in Mississippi, would you be excited by that? Because you probably wouldn't have a cell phone if that was the case. Um, or if you did have a cell phone, if, if the government of Mississippi, not that it could because of the US Constitution, but if the government of Mississippi decided that it was going to require every cell phone sold in Mississippi to be made in Mississippi, you might eventually get somebody assembling a cell phone in Mississippi, but it probably wouldn't be anything like as good as the cell phone you have. Um, don't get me wrong, mate. It's great when the American economy does well and people buy things that are made in America, but it's also good when people buy things that foreigners make. Because as this video is about to show, foreigners buying things off us and selling things to us is, is what comparative advantage is all about. Um, before we press this, the, the, the play button on this video, how many of you, um, how many of you have heard of Tasmania? Yeah, Tasmania. Uh, have you you've heard of Tasmania? Do you read about it on page starting page seventy eight in the book? This is a trick question. I wanted to see how many of you have, have, have been reading the book. No. Okay. Okay. Because this starts off with a little anecdote about Tasmania, and it's quite interesting because the person who made this video is clearly influenced by Matt Ridley's book, um, and it begins with a little story about Tasmania and you might think why why is Stone Age Tasmania got anything to do with comparative advantage um, this video explains why it is that from the Stone Age to the digital phone age we need to have trade with our neighbors because if we don't we end up being being poor so a short five minute video and then maybe if you've got any thoughts we'll discuss Let me tell you about the island of Tasmania. It's about 130 miles off the coast of southeastern Australia. A long time ago, when seas were low, Tasmania was part of Australia. During that time, the archaeological record documents that Tasmanians fished and they used bone tools. About 10,000 years ago, rising waters cut Tasmania off from Australia. On at least three of the smaller islands, the isolated human population died out completely. In Tasmania, 
The 4,000 hunter-gatherers remained with no contact with the rest of humanity at all. They lost technologies they once had. No more fishing, no more bone tools. They also missed new inventions such as stone tools and fishing nets and fire that were adopted in Australia. When Europeans discovered the Tasmanians in 1642, they found that this extreme isolation had created the simplest material culture of any people in the modern world. Without access to other people, some island populations shrink, others even vanish. Fortunately for most of us, human cooperation has expanded over time. As we saw in the previous videos, we enjoy enormous benefits from specialization and trade. One reason for this beneficial cooperation is what economists call comparative advantage. Two things are surprising about comparative advantage. First, just by rearranging who does what, we can make more stuff through specialization and trade, even if no one ever gets any better at doing any line of work. But the second insight's my favorite. If you get better at doing something, that obviously benefits you, but it also benefits me, even though my abilities to produce haven't changed at all. Let me show you how this works. It's best seen with a simple example. Just two people, Bob mm. and Ann, mm. who produce just two goods, bananas mm. and fish. Mm. Here's what Bob can do if he spends all of his time producing only one good. Bob can either gather 10 bananas or he can catch 10 fish. Ann can either gather 10 bananas or catch 30 fish. Mm. So let's say they each split their time between producing bananas and fishing. Bob and Ann each produce five bananas, Bob produces five fish, and Ann produces 15 fish. In total, they produce 10 bananas and 20 fish. You math wizards in the audience surely see an obvious way to increase this total. If Bob produces just bananas and Ann produces just fish, then the total rises to 10 bananas and 30 fish. So just by rearranging who does what, we get more total stuff. Now you might think this outcome is simply the result of the division of labor that we covered previously, but you'd be wrong. The key insight from the division of labor is that workers individually get more productive when they specialize. Yet in this scenario, neither Bob nor Ann has gotten any better at producing bananas or fish. Just by rearranging what tasks each does is what made total production increase. The key to understanding how this works is opportunity cost. Bob has to choose to gather bananas or catch fish. When he chooses to gather a banana, he gives up one fish. In essence, Bob trades with himself. Hmm. He can use his time to gather bananas or trade that time to catch fish. And the cost of that trade is one fish per banana. Hmm. That's Bob's opportunity cost. The same holds true for Ann, but her cost of producing one banana is three fish. In the amount of time that it takes Ann to gather one banana, she could have caught three fish. She trades with herself, one banana for three fish. So Bob only has to give up one fish to produce one banana, but Ann must give up three fish to produce a banana. Ann's opportunity cost of gathering a banana is higher than Bob's. She can improve her situation if she can get bananas for less than three fish, and Bob mm -hmm. can improve his situation if he can get fish for less than one banana. Let's say Ann trades two fish to Bob for one banana. They each gain. If Ann wants a banana, she can either gather it herself and give up three fish, or she can catch only two fish and then trade them to Bob. Hmm. She prefers the lower cost option, and so she hmm. trades. Bob prefers the lower cost option too. Mm -hmm. Instead of giving up a whole banana to catch a fish, he can trade that banana for two fish. Now he's only giving up a half a banana for a fish. You can see that even if Anne is better at everything, nothing in this story changes. She still benefits from trade because the number of fish Anne gives up to pick a banana herself is greater than the number of fish that she must catch and give to Bob in order to get a banana from Bob. Now for an insight that is really counterintuitive. What happens if Anne gets better at fishing? Let's say that she can now catch 40 fish. Obviously, that's good for Ann, but it also means that bananas just got more costly for Ann to produce herself. She didn't have to sacrifice four fish for each banana that she gathers. By becoming a better fisherman, Ann becomes a comparatively worse banana gatherer. Hmm. And this fact helps Bob. Mm. 
The reason is that Ann is now willing to trade more fish for each banana that she gets from Bob. So although Bob's ability to produce hasn't changed, he can now get more fish for his bananas. Comparative advantage is a beautiful thing. No matter what my talents are, I can still help you, even if you are better at everything. The more different we are from each other, the more we benefit from trading with each other. Mm. Let's get back to the real world. What comparative advantage practically means for most people is that we each spend most of our working time at a job that utilizes each of our comparative talents. How do you know what you're comparatively good at? What you could pay for your job tells you that. Comparative advantage is the main force driving us to use our talents in those jobs that we do best. It's why people who are good at math tend to become engineers and those who have a good graphic sense tend to go into the arts. Specialization and trade play key roles in the movement from poverty to prosperity. We would be desperately poor without them, but they alone do not explain the full extent of our prosperity. Another feature of the modern world is important, innovationism. Our society is an orgy of innovations. This innovationism would be impossible without specialization in trade, and yet, specialization in trade do not guarantee innovationism. This is a topic for a future video. Here's the current leaderboard of questions submitted from our viewers. We're going to pick a few of the top ones to answer with more videos, so go and vote. Our society. There was a lot on there about fish and bananas, and um, I'm not sure about you, I didn't follow all the math, but did everyone kind of get the, the, the basic point? Yeah? Had, had anyone come across this idea before? No? Yes? Musa? Ava? Okay. Um, I mean, I, I, it, it's quite complicated, um, and all of that stuff about opportunity cost in particular is, is quite difficult to follow, but I. I think the basic thing to remember, don't worry about it if you don't follow it all in detail. It's basically, the more we specialize, the more productive we become. Um, so I hope that those three, and don't worry, this is not gonna be an economics lecture. That's the, economics, the, the economic theory bit of today over and out of the way. But I'm hoping that you now all follow this idea that there's been this explosion in wealth and prosperity because of these three things being allowed to happen. Free pricing, division of labor, and comparative advantage. So bringing, bringing this back to the real world, America is much more economically successful than pretty much any country around the world. America is, got, has a, a higher standard of living, than most countries, and as we saw from one of the charts last week, certainly there's no other country the size of the United States that has a comparable living standard. This suggests that America is actually quite good at all of these three things. That the prices, despite politicians, are generally set freely. There's a high degree of um, division of labor. In fact, US productivity, the output per worker in America is phenomenally high, certainly compared to Europe. And there's quite a good comparative advantage in America, both within the continental US and, and, and outside. But Mississippi is one of the poorest parts of the United States. And this tells us that actually there are things specific to Mississippi that prevent these things from happening in Mississippi. There are restrictions that we're going to look at um, when Forrest is talking. Restrictions on healthcare, for example, that prevent the division of labor and the pricing mechanism allocating resources efficiently. Um, there, there are restrictions called certificate of need that we try to get rid of, but they directly prevent this magic system of improving healthcare for people in Mississippi. Education, Mississippi has some of the worst education outcomes in the country, not because people in Mississippi aren't smart, not because people in Mississippi don't have tax dollars to spend on education, but because of restrictions put in place that stop people who could be really, really good teachers doing really well as teachers. You, you have these restrictions on um, these um, 
forces being allowed to, to, to improve education. And, and similarly with jobs in Mississippi, a huge number of jobs in Mississippi require a permit from someone. And one of the reasons you can't get the division of labor that you would otherwise have in Mississippi is because of restrictions. You need, you need a permit from someone to do things. So Forrest will talk about how we can make sure that these economic forces are allowed to improve and elevate and enrich Mississippi.